Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome uh, to this talk. Um, artists take on immigration and displacement. It's going to be a talk between Miami artists Juana Valdez, Aurora Molina, and Edison Peñafiel. My name is Dani Tapia. I'm the creator of Art Theme 365, a platform for the promotion of the arts in South Florida. We're being hosted today by Piero Achugarri Gallery, that is also hosting the exhibition Landscape for Edison Peñafiel. Thank you uh, to the gallery uh, for hosting both the, the talk and the exhibition. And this is the first of several programs that have been created around uh, the landscape exhibition. A little bit um, about the gallery, Piero Achugarri Gallery was founded in 2013 in Uruguay and in December of 2018. They expanded to North America by opening their location at the Miami Design District. And um, since then, they have been an integral part of the Miami art scene, not only by presenting international and national artists, but also by giving an opportunity to local talent. So thank you for that. Um, we will also um, we would like to thank the Knight Foundation and the Broward County Cultural Division for their support of uh, the exhibition landscape. And um, thank you to the artists that for joining us today. And uh, before starting, I'm gonna, oh, a little housekeeping is, uh, we are gonna have a conversation uh, for about 45 minutes. And then uh, we leave the last, 15 minutes or so for people to uh, have the opportunity to ask questions. You can write the questions in the chat and I'll make my best to, to read them to, to the artists. So before starting, I'm gonna read the uh, bios of all the artists uh, so that we have a, a good idea. They are all uh, very well-known artists in Miami and South Florida. Uh, let's start with Juana Valdez. Manuel Des is presenting Rest Ashore at Locus Project, a new large scale multi channel video installation. With it, Valdez re examines the Cuban migration experience over the past 60 years and how it relates to the current global refugee crisis. She uses printmaking, photography, sculpture, ceramics, and site specific installations to explore issues of race transnationalism, gender, labor, and class. Functioning as, a, as an archive, Valdez's work analyzes and decodes experiences of migration as a person of Afro-Caribbean heritage. Born in Pinar del Rio, Cuba, Valdez came to the United States in 1971. She received her BFA in sculpture from the Parsons School of Arts, uh, sorry, from the Parsons School of Design in 1991, her MFA in Fine Arts from the School of Visual Arts in 1993 and attended the Skogian, the School of Painting and Sculpture in 1995. She is currently an associate professor in the art department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you, Juana, for joining us today. Aurora Molina uses the potential of fiber arts and the tools of embroidery, sculpture making, drawing, photography, and video to communicate ideas about social and political issues. Aurora was born in Havana, Cuba, and migrated to the United States at the age of 16. She received a bachelor's in fine art specializing in mixed media from Florida International University and a master's degree in contemporary art at Universidad Europea de Madrid. Aurora Molina's work is currently on view at Frost Art Museum as part of the exhibition House to House, Women, Politics and Place, on view until February 2021. She's also part and organizer of the exhibition 40 Women Pulling at the Threads of Social Discourse by Fama and Guests at the Camp Gallery. And that show will be on view until October 25th. Additionally, she will be presenting her project so America Cares at Cora Gables Museum starting on October 31st this year. Thank you, Dori. Thank you. Edison Peñafiel is a visual artist whose work creates experiences about the disadvantage, the migrant, the laborer, the surveil. Using photography, animation, video, sculpture, and installation, he creates surreal reflections of the realities we all 
uh, participate and witness every day. Eddie was born in Ecuador and he came to the US at the age of 17. Eddie, um, he received a BFA in interdisciplinary arts and art history from Florida International University. He has presented his work at the Bass Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art at North Miami when receiving the South Florida Consortium Fellowship and the Orlando Museum of Art where he was a recipient of the 2019 Florida Prize in Contemporary Art. For his exhibition, Landscape, currently on view at Piero Sugar Gallery, he was one of the winners of the Knight Foundation Arts Challenge. His work is also currently on view at the Contemporary Art Center New Orleans in the exhibition, Make America What America Must Become, and at USF Contemporary Art Museum in the virtual exhibition, Life During Wartime, curated by Christian Viveros Faune, who will be in conversation with Eddie presenting the catalog for this exhibition on October the 29th. Before we start the conversation, I uh, wanted to give a little bit of a, a frame uh, about um, immigration in the United States. So it's estimated that about 40 million, in between 40 to 47 million of people in the United States are immigrants. Uh, it's the country with the largest amount of immigrants which provides the diversity that we live in. And Miami-Dade County has an estimated 53% of people that uh, was born somewhere else. So uh, I think that's a, a good frame for, for starting this conversation, having this data. And uh, basically everybody here in the, in the talk, uh, we're all immigrants. The um, gallery is also, <laughs> Uh, you know, funded by somebody who's uh, an immigrant himself. So I think uh, it's very appropriate that we are discussing this thing. So I would like to start by uh, posting this question to Juana, Juana Valdez, who has been for a long time uh, working on his, in her practice, um, this theme of immigration and, and, and reform, you know, so posting this question about uh, her, her own experience and, and, and what it means to be an immigrant. So Juana, what is it important to, at this time, to keep talking about immigration? Hi, Dani, thank you so much for coordinating the, the panel. Uh, and let me know if, you, if I'm coming across okay. Of my, I believe since 2008 that I decided to really focus on it. Um, and I did it because I thought it was really important at the time to look at how I had made it to the United States and what it meant for me, a person of African descent, to not only be in another part of the hemisphere that I was not originally uh, from, and then to actually be speaking a language that wasn't my own, and then to be actually speaking another language that I had to learn. And so I really wanted to take a look at that history, right? And to figure out why all of this has taken place and what, what it meant in terms of our contemporary society at the moment. And so the work begins to really look at that. And the moment I did that, immigration became a really significant component of that. Um, I have to say, when I started the recent project that is a Locust project, it was in 2015. And at that time, I was really, I was looking at the, at the imagery coming across from Europe in terms of the Syrian refugees that were coming into Greece and into Italy. And it created sort of this kind of backlash into the memories I had as a young adult in Miami of the Maria Bolev and then later on the Batzeros um, in 1994. And it really, it, 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 not that I experienced that myself, but I began to see the similarities and how these, uh, these people were being represented. Um, and, and so at that point in time, I felt that it was really important for me to address how this imagery was coming across. Right. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the things that I also noted when I started to do this project, and most recently, I went to the United Nations the Refugee Agency, and their latest quote is that 79.5 million people around the world are displaced at this moment. Right. 
Um, for the project, the Locust Project, I used my own personal background as a Cuban American and looked at the history of Cuban Americans coming into the United States as, as refugee as early as the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s, um, to use that as a framework to then really approach the subject in a, in a more contemporary global uh, perspective. So here we go. Um, so part of the exhibition you'll see is a comparison between uh, a research that the Pew Foundation does on all Hispanics in the United States in relation to assistance that the, the, the specifically the Cuban refugees have received in the United States. Uh, you can go ahead. Um, and so the most contemporary component of the exhibition is a video. And the video, which was actually sponsored through an Ellis Award as well by Ulai, um, really shows or brings the viewer through what the experience of migrating by sea would be. Uh, so the installation uh, that takes the entire gallery space actually allows you to contemplate different aspects, the moment of departure, the idea of what you expire uh, to take place once you arrive at the other place, and more significantly, what you might experience in the journey. I think the other thing that the project does is, which is a really important component of the way in which I'm focusing my work at the moment, is to tie the history of migration into a larger context to the history of trade and the history of global trade and how that history is tied both to colonization and to empire building and later on to settle uh, colonialism and how all of how this contemporary market and global trade is built on that history and the the the, the problems that it has because of that here we're seeing an image of a still from the video right yes yes so the, um, the, just a quick, the video is done in three filming format in which you have aerial photography that functions almost like surveillance. Then you have above land and then uh, underwater cinematography as well. Where I found very interesting of um, the exhibition, which is great experiencing the whole being immersed and, and you can uh, basically feel as if you are as close as possible without actually being in the water, <laughs> to be in, you know, in the water and then unfortunately underwater. Uh, but the data component of the of the exhibition at the beginning really struck me, right? Like understanding how not all um, immigrants are the same or how how different the experience can be for different groups. So I, I was well, uh, wondering, yeah, a, a little bit about the well, I, I, for me, to, when I began to do the research to, to build the exhibition, one of the things that I did was to look at my own history uh, as a Cuban American and so to look at what kind of so, uh, support uh, Cubans have received in the United States. And one of the, one of the, uh, the papers that I found actually was the, is the, the history of assistance to Cuban immigrants. And this, it tracks uh, sort of for over four decades, the, um, how the government of the United States has assisted the, the Cuban migration. Now, of course, when this begins in the 1960s, which one of the first things they do is the, they form the Miami Cuban Refugee Emergency Center, which opens with 1 million in, fund, in federal funding, that's in 1960, that would be in contemporary terms of like close to 7 million. So imagine if $7 million uh, was channeled into any particular group of immigrants that was coming into the United States, what would their possibility to adaptation would be within the United States? And granted, it is all at that time, it's all being done as a political also tactic to to promote democracy in the world. But because of that, and, and incidentally to it, Cuban uh, refugees coming into the United States in the early 60s received a, a lot of significant support. The, the Pew Foundation, which is the other actually historical component about that, what it offers is the statistics of the, what that means in a longer period of time, which what that means is you have Cubans overall from all Hispanics in the United States tend to own more property 
um, most Cubans who live in Florida own more property than Cubans that live anywhere else in the United States. Um, they also have a higher rate of going for higher education. Um, and so all these tasks that are tracked over periods of time by the Pew Foundation shows you how the how this particular group of refugees in the United States have been uh, able to adopt and how they sort of rank in relationship to the other. Aurora, I, I think that you want uh, to add something about why, why do you think it's important now to have this conversation or to bring this? Oh, hello to everyone. Um... Juana, that was very informative. Thank you for that. <laughs> and as you're showing the slide, I'm just reading into the smaller letters. Um, I think it's just the different fluxes of immigration. I went to see the show and we had, we sat down and had a conversation on this perception of newer generations migrating, the reasons why. Um, Juana, you came as a child, Eddie and myself, we came as teenagers. So. Uh, we basically were dragged by the response to our parents to come to the United States for a better opportunity. Um, so the, the, I think the trigger to the work that we're doing and the why it's important to talk about this issue, it's the very same reason why um, everything um, it's being um, as a motive, it's it's being moved. Um, so there's something that has triggered so many artists to go and you know and do and, and go inward into our own stories and um, talk about it. Um, so at least it happened for me when when you know I started to talk about immigration. There was a trigger, and I didn't know why. And it was when I went to that personal story. Um, and asking those questions as to why I'm here, why I came here, that these whole series of work started to develop. And then you go into, um, just like Juana said, into the global aspect of it, into looking that you're not only these one group of um, migrant that has left this very particular country, but how many other people have gone on the same path and how displacement has looked for um, the different kinds of immigrations. Um, just today, I met a friend of mine that she's from Greece, um, and I love the relationship. Um, I have it right here. Um, I love this relationship uh, that you just started talking about the Syrian war and how the, the migrants um, just started to get to the coast of Greece. And this is an example of that little child that we all watch on TV at the shore of the Mediterranean water, just dead, you know? Um, and this was in 2015. So definitely it's been going around. Um, um, and I think it just reached our waters and that's why we're looking at it more in depth. So this series of work um, that you're looking into the screen um, started the day that I was watching the TV um, and I heard uh, the voiceover of a reporter that had got into one of the um, detention centers and I just felt like an arrow went through my heart. Just listening to these kids crying and sobbing and asking for their parents I started to take pictures of the screen and that was the very same second I said, you know, I have to do something like this just, you know, it, 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 it went so deep and I couldn't figure out why, you know? And as I was saying, it, it, it started to become um, a reflection and then I knew why. And I knew um, that I was separated from my dad when I was eight years old, he came to the United States um, and I didn't see him for eight years. And as a child, you don't understand that he did it for the sake of your future. You just understand that as a sense of, um, you know, your dad just abandoned you. Uh, so I understood where these kids were coming from at a personal level. Um, of course, the circumstances are completely different. Um, 
you know, precisely we were separated for eight years because um, he decided to wait through a whole legal process for our family to get to the United States with um, um, legal residency. But can you just imagine the circumstances of these other children that they get dragged by their parents to come into a country where you're just putting them at risk? Um, and um, I was talking with the same friend um, this morning just during breakfast and it's like, can you imagine the desperation of just doing so, um, of going through, you know, rough waters with these minor and you're just thinking that you're going to reach that other end. Um, and that's just unbearable to, to, to think, you know. Um, I think also a trigger to this series was the fact that um, this happened in 2018, um, in July, and I had recently had my daughter, and it had even another layer into it, uh, thinking that given the circumstances, um, what would I do, you know, um, and how would I do it? You touch on something uh, that brings me uh, to, to Eddie's work and I wanted to, to ask Eddie, which is the, the cyclical or, or how this came now to us, but it has been an issue that has that keeps happening and keeps happening. And and it has different different iterations and, and, and different circumstances. And I think um, in, in, in examining that same question of why now, I, I would like to, to take Eddie's perspective of how do you feel yeah. this time, Leo? Um, at least for me, and, and my work is not about the present. Um, since you mentioned it, I've been working in this idea for, for quite a time, uh, starting with the piece uh, that is back here. Um, so it's, it's not about the present or this moment. It is uh, what is currently happening in, with this issue on, on a national level, especially right now with the presidential campaign and putting Putting it in this context, I think it will politicize the work in a way, and it's not of my interest of, of making a political campaign. And uh, I think where I'm going with, with the work and what I'm producing goes beyond that conversation. Uh, as Juana said, is, is, is talking about uh, from the specific, from, from the own experience uh, to the global scale. So to me, it is about starting a dialogue and create empathy towards uh, other human beings and humanity in general, uh, as well as the conditions uh, they face uh, in the global scale through these journeys, as, as Aurora mentioned. And uh, from the human rights uh, perspective, the articles I read a few years ago, and that part was very interesting to me. Uh, is that everyone has the right to movement and residency within the borders of, of each state. And everyone has the right to leave any country, including their own, and also return back to, to their country as well. So with these works, uh, I am questioning the, the ideas of border, laws, questioning segregation, injustice, identity, land, and also presenting how surreal and absurd uh, these situations have been throughout history and the present. And considering that we are in one way or another um, from other lands or, or, or parents or grandparents, we were not exempt from, from the situation happening to, to us. So uh, because history repeats itself, basically, and, and then my work deals with, with that aspect of. Yeah, as a, as a um, second main question, I wanted to uh, give each of you an opportunity to talk about how this particular work that you're presenting at the time uh, fits the narrative of what you have been working along in your career. So, um, for one in particular, and I'll go back to the to those images so that we um, can see a little bit about this is uh, a departure from your um, for what you have done before. So basically, here you are exploring video, and um, 
installations is something you have done before, but not, not with video. So tell us a little bit about how, how was this uh, decision to go this direction? Um, so uh, I think part of what decision for me, and, and to just go back a second uh, also to, to what Eddie was mentioning, um, it, it, for me, it's important to, to note that this is not in the way that I was thinking about the video specifically, was that I wanted to generate imagery that allow for anyone to be in that place and to remove the idea of, of, of immigration or migration as something that happens to this other. Right, but to place anyone who went into the space with the notion that this could happen to them at this point in time. And this idea of migration is not just something happening in poor countries in other parts of the world, but that it could at any point in time, a catastrophe could happen even here in the United States that could be forced people to migrate as it has happened with the hurricanes and the fires and so forth. Um, when I started to when I decided to work with video for me, this is the first time working with video. I did it because I wanted to intervene specifically in the in, in the history of moving image and to create and to generate a new imagery that allow for the subject matter to be discussed without relying on the representation of people from poor countries um, as the main sort of. Uh, uh, viable agency of, of what that meant. And so the whole video from beginning to end, there are actually no bodies presented, which is interesting in relationship to Eddie's work, whereas you see the body is central to, to the work. Um, and in the video piece, and even in the installation and everything else, there are always references to the bodies via the object, but there are no physical bodies with, within the space or within the video itself. Um, I, I wanted to use video. I thought it was the best way to, to communicate the, the urgency of, of this. And, and that was why I decided to integrate video in, into the process of installation, which is something that I've done in the past. Thank you. And, uh, Aurora, maybe um, now I show a couple of your images, but then um, you can walk us through how you know, we you started uh, telling us about the experience of listening to these kids uh, talk about you know crying and calling for their parents and how this prompted you for to start uh, doing this work and how this evolved to the work that you're gonna present um, at the Coral Gables Museum on the thirty first. Um, so it's sort of like you know evolving into from sort of like the lens of the artist as a unison into the installation and the weavings to something that I felt it needed to be shared and extended to the community. Um, so that's when So America Care started and it started after I went with um, my galleries, Bernice Steinbaum to Books and Books to listen to a conversation um, from Sherry Little from American, American for Immigrant Justice. Um, and basically at the end of the conversation after she brought out all the statistics, all the work that American for Immigrant Justice has done for most of these immigrants, illegal immigrants and how they have um, been behind the detention center in Homestead and re reuniting um, some of the families that had been separated she basically said, you know, from wherever you're standing, do whatever you can do, but history cannot repeat itself, which is, you know, Eddie just say it. And I, I, I think um, that was the trigger to start this project. Um, so I contacted them, we proposed this project um, um, and they provided me with um, 10 pictures of 10 children that had been in these legal limbo um, because I needed to be faithful to what it is. I didn't these, I didn't want these drawings to be drawings of any other children, but drawings of children that had gone through these. And when people were invited to participate, they felt that they were real. Even some people said, do you have any other kids that are smiling? And I said, this is how I got the pictures. It's like these stone cold 
image that says it all you know it's almost like you're seeing through the eyes of the children and there's no expression in there there's like a void so i created these 10 drawings off of those photographs um under um laser edge on canvas um and what i wanted to do was extend um the project so i'm, I'm sort of like the director of the orchestra but without the people there's no music um there's no um synchronicity um so um i last summer um i, I was traveling and before i left i had done you know i had contacted some friends it's like here you have 10 of these templates um i'll be back um, and then see what you could do, see how you could interpret these. So what was important as a fiber artist was to use the metaphor of the thread, of the mending, of the fixing, um, dwelling to build up the image rather than applying paint or having the artist coming forward. I wanted it to be uh, for the whole community, for anyone that uh, felt empathy with this situation um and um i started to get friends from all around the world to ask me can you send me kits can you send me um, so it became um to my surprise um, i was counting on the community that i have access to which is the miami community but to my surprise it became these uh sort of like a, you know a post office job that i was sending uh, faces everywhere. So I've gotten it from um, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Guatemala. I just got 50 of these faces done by a group of um, um, Guatemalans that I don't know that they requested they have a needing group and they wanted to work on them and they felt the responsibility to work on these because these are the children, these are the future of their country. And they're just so delicate, you know, um, and they have the grandmothers who are also needing has have invited their grandchildren into it. So the project, it's that the essence of the project, it's, you know, having all these people coming together to later um, create a quilt. Um, and that metaphor of the quilt of patching it together of all these stories. Um, these work is by Maria Lino, who's a Cuban immigrant, and uh, she's a multimedia artist. And, and she says, you know, every time I sat down and watched the news, this is what I was sort of like filtering through, you know. And I think in those stitches, in that same composition, you could read um, the empathy of people thinking about these children and, you um, you know, for more than you go and you uh, go to the protest and you're angry about this situation, I needed to see it from a point um, of fixing, of mending, of, of, of something positive, um, like reconstructing almost the faces of these children, giving them their soul back. So this is a Cuban American immigrant. She came uh, during Peter Pan and she cannot even talk about the work because she starts crying because she was one of these children. Um, so as part of the project, um, there is a paper that comes with it where I'm collecting all of those stories uh, that also are as important as the image itself. Um, so, uh, you know, the connection, it's immediate, uh, but what's most important is that the idea that translate into the little phase it's um, of a person that's taking a time to think about these children so history does not repeat itself and as immigrant thinking about that otherness that um, that Juana was mentioning we're able to touch base with the reality that was once ours you know how did we get here do not forget that um, and it's it sort of like, instead of continue that um, sense of, uh, you know, coming apart, it's I'm patching it together, I'm building it together. Um, so, you know, the project deals with um, all of that. 
I'm actually at five, um, five to 600 pieces. Um, my goal is to have 1000 um, of the faces and um, the ownership, it's everyone that had participated in it. So it's definitely um, a, a part of that social practice that's in the work. Um, as so it people is- People can still participate, sorry. Aurora, people can, or it's already kind of late for that. No, I'm still collecting and sending out faces. It's just that um, I'm closing the quill this week uh, oh. because the show is coming up. But as I'm, um, keeping to collect them, the quilt's gonna continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and just a piggyback into um, this series that sort of like, you know, it happened in the middle of this project. Um, I'm a teaching artist and I teach in, um, you know, underserved communities. Um, so I, I was teaching with Project Art at the Hispanic um, Library um, last, uh, last year. And um, the reason why I requested to work at this very specific place, it's because of that interception uh, with the kinds of um, immigrant community that he has. Um, so I wanted to touch base with the kids. I want I, the, the project that I, um, that I proposed had to do with immigration, sort of like gain back that respect for their culture um, through the project that we were doing. And then Eddie reached out to me and he said, I, that, that I have this opportunity. Um, I want to work about um, the same sort of like um, issues. We started to talk about um, the nomadic experience. And I said, you know, I'm working with the kids. Why don't we create this um, immersive installation um, and video with the same kids and let them have ownership of all these ideas that we have been discussing. Um, and it was a great experience for the kids. I mean, they got to experience the green screen. They got to create their own character. Uh, we talked to them about the idea of marching, of displacement. So all of these concepts um, of the other started to be sort of like a reflection of themselves. And they started to tell us stories about how their family got here, whether they speak Spanish at home or not. And this installation happened. So the characters that you see um, are um, a mix of um, the different children uh, being filmed. And then the background stories, um, the landscapes are drawings of the kids, um, understanding that sense of displacement. And then of course, all the kids got invited um, to the show and they were super excited about, about coming and experiencing um, and uh, it was a great way of, you know, continue that conversation, collaborating with Eddie and uh, looking at the same issue through a different lens. So um, this exhibition was in Fat Village for people who, who didn't get to see it in Fort Lauderdale, really a, a huge space. All of the panels were, uh, remind me, Abe, uh, they, they were huge. I can't, they were- 30, 37 feet by 15 feet, uh, right, Eddie? Yeah, around that. Around 30 that. by 15. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was lucky enough that I got to, to see when Eddie and Aurora were filming and working with the kids, which was a great experience seeing the kids participate and then they, putting the panels together and then installing. And uh, still the day that I went to see the exhibition for the first time, even though I was looking at the behind the scenes, it really it really moved me to tears. It, it, it was that impressive, it, it, immersive. And I, it's, it was just super uh, touching. It's, I, I it was right, sorry to interrupt, Danny. Um, this was right in the time that we uh, that we had when we started to work on these. It was um, right in the time that there was a big caravan mm. from Venezuela to Colombia, right. and we also I got to talk to the kids about that too, um, sort of like to appreciate what their parents have done for them, uh, to think about the circumstances of the adult, which is different to the kids. Um, and uh, we got to talk about even the, you know, the different foods, because uh, I had kids from El Salvador, Honduras, mostly Central American. 
And that's another thing that you would think in Little Havana, do you have the Cuban community? And now there's that uh, sort of like displacement within the same community and getting a, a new flux of immigrants that are setting new restaurants and new culture. And I think that's the one thing I always appreciate from Miami, it's that sense of diversity um, and the good restaurants too. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and Eddie, I wanted to take the opportunity that we're looking at the, um, the perceived and caravan images to, to move to uh, the installation now landscape and also touch on how you are also departing from your usual video work or um, you know the, what is you're more known for, and going into these compositions that were paintings. So I'm gonna be. I don't know if you wanna walk us through from from these images. Yeah, let's start. Let's start with the the current exhibition at Piero. Okay. Um, That's so this uh, is the third iteration of, of this project, which is a collection of 10 large scale paintings, um, mixed media in, in this case. And these are presented as an installation or an intervention considered in the, the gallery space. And the intervention consists of this also barbed wire, uh, which extends uh, in front of the, of the paintings separating the, the viewer from, from these uh, characters. So there is this idea of separation that, or segregation that comes in, into the work and the installation. And uh, all of these paintings were built uh, for, for the space. And also considering there is an exit sign in, in, the, in the gallery, all of the characters are pointing towards that direction, which is very important in, in my work considering uh, a space as, as part of the, of the piece. So let's go back to the multimedia installation, Daini. Uh, that one is, um, was created during an art residency in Corsicana, Texas. And it was presented at the MOCA North Miami for the South Florida Cultural Exhibition, Cultural Consortium Exhibition. And uh, this is a composition of multiple projections uh, on chiffon fabric, which is translucent. And this allows me to uh, multiply these characters in an analog way rather than digitally. And, and also part of this work is a um, um, composition of sound and this uh, barbed wire fence again in the work. So the, the common denominator in this work is it, are the characters, masked characters, uh, trudging through through a landscape, and the barbed wire separating them from from the viewer. And um, let me see. So the next iteration was presented at the Walgreen Windows uh, by the Bass Museum. Uh, so this is a project space uh, for public art, and. Um, Tapping into art history again, uh, going back to, to the Greeks and this pan ethnic procession and ritual kind of uh, thing of, of people walking towards one direction or, or in, an ever, in a never ending uh, journey, basically. So all of these characters uh, are facing towards one direction, which is the corner of these Walgreens windows, uh, with Walgreens uh, building uh, towards the exit of, of the, or entrance of the, of the space. And um, in this case was the first time, well, the second time that I used color in, in my work, and, but very minimalistic, just one solid color to represent uh, something very local, in this case, water and the migration through water to, to get to, to Florida or to the States, as well as more of a desertic or very sunny um, type of landscape uh, on, on the yellow uh, background. One constant has been the use of the barbed wire. And I think the messages are 
it's like two two different type of uh, it's the same message but trying to portray in two different uh, um, two different ways like in in the case of Juana's work you are sitting there almost as if you are in the in in the water or in the the vessel that was wrecked and in this case for for your installations people get to walk alongside the the migrants, but then there is that separation, making sure that you understand that these people are really being kept out. So yeah. it's um, interesting how the same, the same. Uh, I, if I interrupt. Sure. No, I was gonna. I was just gonna make a, a comment. I don't know if you can hear me now any better. Yes, um, better. And the the comment was that. Okay, the, the comment was that one of the things that I did in my installation was also to set up the, the, the pallets. So there's a whole series of pallets in which you can either sit in, but when you first enter the space, they also work as a barrier. And it was very much intentionally in that same way to make people aware that there was this need to, to sort of cross or that people were, you're being separated or that there was this, in, this interference that did not allow you accessibility to, to a place, you know. Um, and thinking about Eddie's work and the way that the barbed wire functions, it reminded me a lot of the decision to, to set up the, the pallets in the installation in that same way. Definitely. And also the idea of anonymity with, with Juana's work and also uh, Aurora's work by um, intervening these these spaces uh, from photographs which she transformed to drawings and then intervene to with uh, another person's uh, aesthetic. Uh, so this idea of anonymity, this could be anybody. And um, yeah, the, the idea of belongings, this, this belongs to someone, someone was here, the, the idea of presence. In my case is, uh, I am performing all of these characters and uh, wearing a mask and assuming these different personas to, to portray them. But in the end, I'm not trying to, to adopt an identity. I, it is very um, noticeable that it is a mask. <laughs> yeah, and there's someone behind it, but you cannot know who, who is that person behind. It could be anybody. So that, that is very important uh, to me to get away from, from the specific and, and go more into the general as all of us are, are doing with, with our own projects. In, in your words, the three of you, um, empathy is very important. You know, you, I feel like you are trying to, to create this empathy that I think for us as immigrants, it's it's very um, easy to tap into. I would think, no, not speaking for everyone. But how much do you feel like um, you are actually reaching other people who might not have our experiences that may not be have a point of uh, understanding or a point of entrance because they haven't experienced it recently because their families are not migrants or you know how, how much do you think um it has been effective if you have any if you have any experiences with that and this is open to me i'll tell you a story um I've, I've been working this is a very neutral invitation um i'm on the same um vote with uh, with um Eddie, when it comes to it's not propaganda, it's just, you know, it is political because we're citizens and it, it has a stand. Mm -hmm. um, and you're manifesting it through the sort of like collectiveness. But on the same people that participate, they have different views, even with the same um, cost and effect of the situation. And um, my mother in law, um, you know, sees one of these faces that I posted from someone that um, had uh, like these dreads that said vote for Vitam. And she calls me, it's like, you know, there's two, it's been two nights that I cannot sleep. It's like, what's going on? 
She says, I love the project. I identify, um, she immigrated from Cuba to Venezuela and then Venezuela to the United States. So she knows immigration firsthand, uh, but I don't wanna be in a project that is partisan. This is not about that. I don't wanna be involved in a project that's provoking the sense of, um, again, divisiveness. Um, and I said, you're completely right. You know, if I allow one thing, um, I have to allow the other thing because it's the voices of all these people, of all these collective participating. So I contacted the artist and I said, I explained the situation. She said, you know, I understand. She saw it as a way of engaging to, um, to sort of like change policy on this situation, but it's not about that it becomes global in the sense that it's not only talking about the kids and at this point in time that this situation is happening, but all of those kids, all of those statistics that Juana talked about of all, you know, through the history um, of, of, of the immigrants and now how the children have been put or taking um, around uh, by the decision of an adult. So the empathy is towards the children that had no say in it um, and how we are as adults um, were responsible for their sake. Um, so it's not only the, the otherness in terms of you're not an immigrant, put yourself in this situation, but within the same immigrant community, the disparity that exists and how um, devices, uh, divisive we were becoming. And it has to do again uh, with forgetting where you're coming from, with not allowing yourself to be reminded of that was once your reality. Um, and now you're in a better position and you tend to think about the other, like it's very much away from you. Uh, and I think all the works um, that we've been working lately has to do with that. Um, I, it talks about that otherness, but with a sense of the now and now and how we're perceiving these things. I mean, I have, yeah. No, I just wanted to say that I, for me, it was really intentional. Like I created this video that it's very contemporary, they could apply to any particular uh, group of people in right now who will be migrating. But I also dedicated part of the installation to really pull out that history of immigration by the Cuban community to, to, to sort of bring, bring that experience into a contemporary dialogue because the, so the exhibition actually chronicles the Cuban migrations from the early 60s all the way to the 90s um, with, with the Barceros coming in and you're seeing the diversify of a social class also coming in with different ideas of why they're coming and how they're gonna in, incorporate themselves into the society but it is also to create a distance between understanding or having that space to reflect on how policy can make a difference, right? Even if you don't know it, your ability to have assistance. Um, all Cubans who come into the United States have the possibility to become citizens automatically. That has not been offered to most of the other groups coming into the United States. And whether we think it does or does not have had an impact, it has. You know, and that's where you can see the statistics of the Pew Foundation showing you how significant um, a certain amount of help or just a way in which people are being addressed or taken care of or being supported can make a difference in, in the long run. And so it was really about bringing that history that has been somewhat forgotten in, in sort of an, in the better sort of story of how successful we are as a group that it, at the beginning, it wasn't sure if it was gonna be a successful story or not. It began like the story of all refugees, right? Of being displaced. Yeah, at least my intention is to, to go beyond uh, borders. Uh, as Juan as said, is uh, with the work is, um, I mean, not focusing on the specific issue, but uh, going going beyond that, or, or that specific quality of, of the issue, crossing the desert or the sea or 
or whatever. It, it is just the, the act of, of going from one place to, to the other without any, any um, a specific reference to any group of people. Uh, so that um, this idea or these works that we're doing can apply to in a global scale. And um, so my idea of making this work is uh, that it can resonate uh, with the viewer uh, from any country or, or religion, age, and to see themselves reflected or mirrored in the in the work or the stories that they know from from their parents or relatives or people that they know, uh, and it's just making them really look and and realize that through these stories, through this experience, we are all connected through good and bad, and we are all in in the same boat together. That's true. This has been great. We are on the hour already and wanted to give people an opportunity if anybody um, want to uh, ask a question. We have a comment here from uh, Guadalupe Garcia. She says, excellent works, Juana, Aurora, and Eddie. You're bringing the viewer to empathize and experience the tragic conditions of the migrants in our own body. And um, Okay, George Fishman says, thanks of all of you for this powerful conversation. Aurora, please tell us again where and when the So America Cares Quill exhibit will be presented. And I'll keep you posted on social media, George. Yeah, I have, uh, yeah, I'll remind everybody of the, of the dates for, for the, um, before we sign out. And then um, he also asked, how has the pandemic affected the dynamics of immigration and our sense of empathy, community, and exclusion. Who wants to take that one? The pandemic has well, brought any new perspective to this issue. Well, I, I don't know if it's brought new perspective to the issue. What it has done is that it's made it subsize because of the nature of the media to be sort of kind of hungry for whatever is the next topic. It has made it subside into the background, but those the people who are still, the refugees who are still in camps in Europe, they're still in camps. They're, they're, their needs haven't changed. The number of people who are being displaced have not changed. Um, it's completely the opposite at the number numbers have increased. Uh, what has, I think for me, the right question is how has the pandemic changed us in the ability to question the security of home and what it is to have a home to go to and how we can then think about what it mean, must be like to not have a home to go to, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where I feel that I hope that this moment of reflection that we've had as a society worldwide in a way, and to really value the ability to have a home to be in, you know, to quarantine in, uh, becomes something that you can empathize with for the rest of those people who do not have a home to be in. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it has reinforced the idea of the most vulnerable um, and um, I mean, even the statistics for the American for Immigrant Justice, they have been one of the um, organizations that have been on the back of policy to change how these migrants in this legal limbo that still haven't been uh, re reunited with the families have been treated in these detention centers, that there's no space, there's no infrastructure. And they're basically just at the hands of, you know, the government and the government being worried about the rest of, you know, the society at large. So there, it's another layer that puts them and downgrades them um, on the priority list. Um, so, but I think definitely the empathy, it's, I completely agree with you, it's having to know that you have a roof to be under, um, even for homeless people, the sense of displacement, um, you know, and what the pandemic has done um, to them. So it, it adds another layer, if anything. Um, there have been some horrible, horrible stories about the conditions of people who are uh, 
detained um, during the pandemic and how harsh the you know has been to try to keep the sanitary conditions with all kinds of different materials that probably are not uh, yeah. safe for using. We have a comment or a question from somebody on Facebook. It says, what about the new wave of Cuban refugees who have to travel over all over South, Amer South and Central America? I think that has happened for quite some time. I know of uh, many mm -hmm. people who travel to Venezuela as uh, Aurora was saying, but I don't know if, if you have any comments about that. This is a question from by Julian Pardo. What about? I, I, th I think, and, and that was another trigger to start this work. Um, and, and I think for many artists it's been, is seeing how, you know, people that I know that are close to my family, to me, that they have gone through these paths of coming, you know, through the Rio Grande, they forget. They have a complete amnesia on their own story. And when they are here, they forget how it's that like for other people. And that has been another trigger. It's like, how can you just say they could have come here legally, you know, or given the situation that you are a Cuban and you get here and you are abducted on these, these law, uh, after a year, you become legal. So you're hiding for a year and then boom, magic happens for you. So how is that like for friends that I have that have been illegal mm -hmm. for 16, 17 years and they continue to be? Um, and how you're not as an immigrant, uh, you know, conscious about that. And you talk about the other, like the other, it's, you know, again. Um, and, and I think we tend to, forget, tend to forget that there are many other, um, refugees from many other countries in South Florida. We just happened to mm -hmm. be a lot of, of people from uh, Latin America over here, but there are many other experiences uh, that are also hard and harsh. We just happened to, to be the higher concentration. And also uh, the other point that I think sometimes we forget is that all immigrants, uh, even the ones, you know, people who came, um, most of the time you leave your country because you have no, no choice, you know? And, and then once you're here, you really have no choice to go back. It's to become an American, you become part of society. And that's, that's basically what we want, right? To be able to be part of the fabric and to, to contribute because in reality, going back is, is for many reasons, different reasons, it's not, not an option. Yeah. Well, I, oh, I have a, one last question. It says, Emily Son, it says, in relation to the answer to the previous question about the pandemic changing us to rethink the value and privilege of home, do you also think the pandemic has affected the role of art in raising the questions of home and producing empathy for immigrants? I, I tell you one thing that had happened to these projects is that I have gotten more requests now of people wanting to intervene the little face because they're more at home. Um, and they're seeing it as a way of like filtering in these um, sort of like solitude. Um, and they're, they're taking it as this is the time that I have to think about these because the world make me stopped around uh, the clock. You know, and it's been great because whether you do it now or you did it before, also, as a human being, you have to find the time to find that empathy and the purpose to work on these. So for So America Care, the pandemic has been wonderful because it has engaged people into sitting and using that long time in the house because you're not running around like a headless bunny, you know. So I, I, I've seen it, I've seen it as something very positive. Um, and it's like, okay, I have to drop off my kid in New York and I have to quarantine, can I have five faces and I'll work on them? And it's like, of course. So um, I, I think it has given us that breath um, to, to stop and dwell on it. And it's a great moment for Fiverr art. Everyone's connecting with their hands, so. Yeah. That's true. Well, I think we're gonna, if there are any last um, 
comments, Juana, Eddie, that you want to do before we close? I, I just wanted to say, which I think is a really significant component of all of our works, um, which address it from different perspective and different length. I, I find that for my work, I tend to be more removed. It's almost like writing in the third person, but uh, the idea of the trauma, the trauma that happens, um, the generational trauma, um, and especially also in children, um, they persist even after they grow up in the example that Aurora did of the, uh, the Pedro Pan. And I think that that hopefully, which comes across in all of the works, is doing something, is what I should say, is art's ability to create empathy for the, for, for the other or for the people who are being, for the refugees that are being impacted by the, by the, by the displacement. Um, I think that that's a really significant component of, of the works that we're doing right now, um, whether if it slowly stays within the realm of art or not, it's a totally different thing. Whether it's whether the pandemic impacts it or not, it's also a, a complete different thing from the way that I'm seeing it. But mm -hmm. I, I feel that it is an important role that the works are, are using to, to create change. Thank you. Maybe. Um, just, uh, I agree with what uh, Juana said, and it's, well, it is up to the work then. <laughs> you, you focus all your energy into creating uh, this concept, an idea, a cohesive idea, and then you put it out there and it becomes its own entity, be, and being able to, to affect a space and change uh, a perspective, or consider at least a perspective, then the work is, is, is done there. It's, at the end, it becomes just an excuse to talk about an idea. That's true. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank everyone who joined us. Thank you so much for listening to the conversation, to, for being here. Uh, just a couple of reminders about the work of the artists and where you can see it. Juana's exhibition at Locus Projects will be on view until next Saturday, the 24th. And um, there is a round table that Locus uh, is uh, putting together where Juana will be in conversation with Arlene, Arlene Davila, Donette Francis, and Maria Elena Ortiz. And that's gonna happen on the 20th, right Juana? That's the, yes. 20th, the 20th of uh, October. Um, Aurora's work uh, for uh, women pulling at the threads of social discourse is going to be on view until the 25th, which is next Sunday at the Camp Gallery. You still can see her work at the Frost Art Museum um, until February next year. And the, um, the uh, So America Cares should be going into the Coral Gables Museum by the end of the month, right? Halloween okay. day, you won't forget Halloween. it. Halloween, <laughs> okay, you won't forget it. The exhibition uh, for Eddie's exhibition at uh, Landscape at Piero Achugarri Gallery will be on view until November 14th. And uh, there will be other several activations for this project. And uh, just keep tuned. Uh, the one that we mentioned earlier is uh, when he will be in conversation with um, Christian Viveros Faune. Uh, for the presentation of the catalog and to talk about the, the curatorial text that he wrote for the, for the exhibition. And uh, thank you so much to Piero Achugarri Gallery again for hosting us today and thank you everybody. Uh, thank, thank you. Danny. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, thank you. Eddie, Aurora. Thank wonderful. you, Juana, Aurora, thank you. for participating. <laughs> thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.